Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is John Allison, chairman and CEO of BB&T, a $121 billion financial services holding company, mostly a bank that you may see on your street corner here and there. It's the nation's 12th largest. I heard Mr. Allison give a very provocative speech a few months ago on how respect for self-interest and property rights has helped him build B&T to what it is, and I thought our listeners would find the ideas in that speech as interesting as I did. John, welcome to Econ Talk. Uh, good morning. Pleasure to be here. Uh, tell us about BB&T as a bit of an introduction, uh, how it's grown in recent years and how long you've been there and, and what your role's been. Um, you know, BB&T is the oldest uh, financial services holding company headquartered in North Carolina, started in 1872. Uh, it started as a uh, farm bank. And when I joined BB&T in 1971, that's exactly what we were. We had about... Uh, $250 million in assets and about 250 uh, employees. Uh, we've now grown to a multi-state financial services holding company with $121 billion in assets and 30,000 employees. Um, <clears throat> we're um, a little unique in that we operate as a series of 33 community banks with very decentralized decision-making, lots of local autonomy, and, and the purpose of that is to enable us to treat our clients on a very individualistic, very personal basis. And yet we do have the resources of a larger company, so we hopefully uh, can feel local and and act uh, in a way that provides people with very sophisticated services at the same time. Where where are your uh, banks located? Um, you started off in North Carolina. Was it mainly a North Carolina bank for a while? For a long time, but we're now, basically, we cover from Maryland uh, through the mid-Atlantic and southeast states uh, into Florida, and then we go west into uh, uh, Alabama, Tennessee, uh, Kentucky, West Virginia. And do you have plans to expand beyond that? Um, we will, but right now we're mostly focused on increasing our market share in the markets we already operate in. Uh, we like to be in the top five in market share. We we are in most of our markets. Uh, for example, in Virginia, where, where you are, we have the second largest uh, uh, market share in, in the state of Virginia. And how has your growth path been within the markets that you're in? It's been very rapid. We've done lots of acquisitions of community banks and thrifts. We've bought a lot of insurance agencies. Uh, we're the sixth largest insurance broker in the U.S. Uh, so we've had very rapid growth over the years. Is it only through acquisition? Uh, our internal growth has also been very healthy. And your strategic um, internal culture uh emphasizes a respect for um, self-interest. Tell us what you mean by that and whether I got that right. Well, you have it right. We have a very strong value system at BB&T. We strongly believe that having the right principles is the foundation for organizational success and the personal success and ultimately the happiness of our uh, employees. So we have a very long-term principle-driven uh, strategy. <clears throat> we have 10 core values at bb and Underlying those values are what we think are the three great virtues, uh, purpose, reason, and self-esteem. So we are very much a purpose-driven organization and encourage our employees to have a sense of purple, personal purpose in their work. We also believe that the <clears throat> fundamental means of Organizational success and personal success and happiness is our capacity to think rationally. Uh, Everything that's alive has a method of staying alive. A lion has claws to hunt with. A deer has speed to avoid the hunter. Uh, We have the capacity to think. And our capacity to think is is literally our only means of survival, success, and happiness. And and thinking effectively, uh, acting rationally, has a certain set of, of standards. So we try to create an environment where people encourage to make logical decisions based on the facts, to act objectively. We think the end result of having a a sense of purpose through your work and using your capacity to think to accomplish your purpose is to raise your self-esteem. And self-esteem is the foundation 
uh, for personal happiness, which is what everybody is try, trying to achieve. We, we think work is a primary means of self-esteem because you spend most of your waking hours and focus at work. So if your work is just work, boy, are you missing a lot of what life is about and that how you accomplish your work, and in a bigger sense, how you live your life, determines the level of self-esteem. So self-esteem is earned from how you live your life. Live your life with integrity, raise your self-esteem. <clears throat> in that regard, we say to all the employees of bb t that it's very important to bb t that you do your job well, but it's far, far more important to you. You know, you might fool me about how well you do your job, you might fool your boss about how well you do your job, but you'll never fool you. And if you don't do your work the best you can possibly do it, uh, you're going to have an immediate, unavoidable negative consequence. You're going to lower your self-esteem. And that's more important than ready to get a raise or ready to get a promotion. The flip of that is also true. Do your work the best you can possibly do it, and you will raise your self-esteem. And that creates a potential uh, over a long life of, uh, of what, I, what we call a virtuous cycle. If you're clear about your purpose, if you use your capacity to think, uh, your ability to reason logically to accomplish that purpose, then you'll raise your self-esteem. And, and in the context of, in that regard, we believe that our employees should act in their rational self-interest. Um, we, we reject the idea that uh, uh, we, we think that taking advantage of other people, which is what people classically call selfish, isn't really selfish. Taking advantage of other people is actually self-defeating. In business, you see that very practically in that, you know, you might fool Tom, you might fool Jane, but pretty soon Tom and Jane are going to tell Sue and Fred and nobody's going to trust you. We also think when you try to focus on taking advantage of other people, uh, that uh, creates the possibility of you becoming paranoid because you get focused on other people's consciousness, and when you try to manipulate other people's consciousness, it has very bad psychological consequences for you. Um, I use the example that I, in my role as CEO, I get to talk to lots of, quote, successful people, but I've never met anybody that was both successful and happy that I think got there taking advantage of other people. I've met some people that were uh, successful in a financial sense, had a lot of money, uh, uh, that I think got there taking advantage of other people, but they were the most unhappy people I ever met. So that taking advantage of other people doesn't work. That's not really selfish. It's self-defeating. We also think self-sacrifice is self-defeating uh, in, in that uh, we use the example of, of altruism where <clears throat> you have to really think about what I would call the movement to the lowest common denominator in, in the sense what, what altruism demands is that if I have more than Fred, then I've got to give it to Fred. But an interesting thing happens. Even if Fred is poor, if he has more than Jane, uh, he's obligated to give it to Jane on down to the lowest common denominator. And unfortunately, there are always people in the process of, of dying. And the only way you can even be equal to somebody that's dying is to die yourself. Uh, uh, and, and if you look at the Middle Ages, the monks took altruism seriously. They beat themselves with whips and drank dirty dish water. <laughs> uh, well, they, they, they took self-sacrifice seriously. I'm not sure they took altruism seriously. Well, I think they took all altruism seriously. I mean, I think that their idea was to be equal to the lowest common denominator, to not have any more than anybody else. Anyway, that's that's my view of that. That's okay. Um, the uh, what we think you ought to be, we think the proper alternative is to be a traitor, to create value for value. Uh, in our business, we help our clients achieve economic success and financial security. They let us earn a profit doing it. Uh, we get better together, and we think life is about creating win-win relationships. And 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 in that context, we should act in our rational self-interest. Because uh, it is in our rational self-interest to create relationships that are good for us, but happen to also be good for the other people we work with, so we, that we get better together. So, so that our our focus in our business is how do we create win-win relationships? And we believe that any time you you get into a lose-win or a, uh, a win-lose relationship, it ends up being a lose-lose relationship. So we don't want to take advantage of other people, nor do we want to sacrifice to other people. Uh, we want to act in our rational, long-term self-interest. And, and, of course, it's in our rational self-interest to help our family, help our friends, help the people we, we, we care about. Um, so, so you're not against, you're not opposed to charity. You don't discourage charitable giving among your employees or by your company. Oh, absolutely not. In fact, uh, I believe I, I'm long been a supporter of the United Way. I believe that uh, uh, 
United Way, which is an umbrella charitable organization, uh, provides very important needed services. And I wouldn't want to be in a kind of community that would exist if there weren't a United Way. So, so I, and I certainly wouldn't want my children to live in that kind of community. So I think it is very much in my rational self-interest to support the United Way. And one of the interesting thing I've found is that uh, because I believe it's in my, in my rational self-interest, I tend to give more and give more consistently. A lot of people that give out of sacrifice find some reason to get bitter. <laughs> and some reason to say, well, there's this wrong with the United Way, there's that wrong with the United They don't do it. And, and, and it's interesting the psychological effect that happens to people many times when they act out of sacrifice. They find reasons often to become embittered. Um, and so we think you ought to evaluate uh, uh, in a bigger picture, long-term life context, which includes creating the kind of community that you want to live in. So one of our, our focuses is to make the community a better place to live, not from an altruistic perspective, but because we live there, <laughs> because we want it to be a better place to be, uh, and it benefits us and benefits, it benefits our families. And I think that's a more objective way, because then you will actually make more rational decisions that are really better for the community in a long-term context. Uh, maybe we'll devote another podcast to the economics of charity. The um, I worry a little bit uh, about the incentives that the United Way faces, but I, I want to put that to the side and, and challenge you on a different point. I, I agree with you. It's nice to live in a good community. We all enjoy the benefits from that, but there's a your narrow self-interest. Uh, I'm not I'll explain what I mean by narrow in a second. Your narrow self-interest is to let other people create that community. So how do you motivate people, if they're rationally self-interested, to share the burden voluntarily of creating that community, right? So true, I'd like a nice a nice community with healthy services and wonderful parks and, and people who are in, can stand on their own two feet and, and are self-actualizing. Uh, but if, they're, if we're struggling to do that, isn't my narrow self-interest to just uh, let other people do that and I'll have more for myself? How do you, how do you dissuade people from being uh, what we call in economics a free rider and, and letting other people do the work? I think that's a legitimate issue, but here's how I feel about that personally. I think it's dropping the context of what your life is about back to your the sense of purpose. I'll I, I tell you a story. Um, early on in my career, um, I was involved, I was on the board of a um, handicap workshop that uh, had people that were physically and, and mentally handicapped, and they made made some products. And and what I found in, the, in working with that that workshop, in many ways, I got some of the psychological benefits that I got from my the, the sense of purpose in the, in my work. Those people had a very high level of integrity. Limited by, in some cases, their intellectual, in some cases, their physical abilities, but they wanted a job. And, and in, in a certain degree, I had a higher level of respect for some of those people than a lot of other people that, that don't want to work. So I didn't get paid money from, from working on the board of that workshop. And we had some real challenges, had some real tough things we had to do to make it successful. We did make it successful. But I got a huge sense of purpose in working with that group of people who were good people. They were limited in a, in, by nature, but they were very good, purposeful people in, in the context. They wanted to come to work, and they wanted to do something productive. So I think you have to get a bigger picture context sometimes uh, of what life is about. I mean, it's, just, it's not just about making money to survive. And that you certainly have to make money to survive, but there, there can be more meaningful uh, and, and more energizing things uh, in a bigger picture p perspective. There are free riders, and that's a problem. But my, my general opinion is you just don't worry about them. Yeah, I and mean, what I, I tell people, sure, you can shirk, um, and you can be a bad person. And, there, you know, we, we use social methods of shunning shirkers. We, we look down on them, and we, we can make them bear social costs, even though they can avoid some monetary costs sometimes in those settings. Um, you know, it's kind of like a team project, either in school or on the job. Sometimes you can get away with not carrying your weight, but what's what's the point of it? I mean, right. it's, as you say, it can be uh, very rewarding to contribute to something that that's that's uh, making the world a better place. Why not revel in that rather than reveling how you in how you got away with something? Right. Uh, I think that's that's a um, it's a a society that can create those feelings certainly goes farther than one that, that can. 
Let me ask just a couple of thoughts. First, I do think sac- charity is secondary. This is, I think this is pretty important. In the, and this is, it's like people were very excited about Bill Gates becoming, you know, involved in charity. I think Bill Gates' contribution was creating Microsoft. <laughs> and the world is probably worse off that he's not focusing on making Microsoft better. I think producing is far more significant than giving it away because you have to produce it to give it away. So I do, I, I'm not against charity, but I do think charity is secondary. And I think we have a real problem in our society in that business people are looked on as kind of being second class, and if you work for the United Way, you're better, quote. I do not, in fact, I don't agree with that at all. I think you have to produce it to give it away, and production's first and charity second, secondary. That's it's a, not bad, yeah, but a, it's secondary. That's a great point, this, this idea that somehow Bill Gates uh, was a thief when he built Microsoft, and now, right. fortunately, he's given some of it back right. via his foundation. As you point out, some of his foundation work may have unintended consequences that may not ultimately achieve the goals they're trying to achieve, whereas – and he's really good at, at building Microsoft. But that's his comparative advantage. He might make the world a much better place by specializing in that rather than trying to figure out how to uh, solve poverty in Africa, which I, I would love for him to be able to do, but it, it's going to be a struggle. Well, you just think if Thomas uh, um, uh, Edison had quit at, at 45 years old, what, what, what would we have lost? And we just don't even know what we lost because Bill Gates basically quit at 45 years old. <laughs> yeah, and and it, it, the odds are, just because of what you said, because of his comparative advantage, he might get lucky and invent something better in charity in Africa. The odds are he won't because he's not special at that. What he was special at was in the computer area. That's right. So I think the world's worse off for it. And, and so, so I think the issue with charity is not that it's not a, a good thing, it's, it, but it is a secondary thing. And it's also a peripheral thing. You know, 95% of the people in a, in a free society don't need charity. <laughs> so right. it's, a, it's a peripheral issue. Right. And, and a, that's, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, well, you've said some, some inspiring things. Uh, a lot of businesses, I uh, used to uh, look at um, business culture and, and – uh, Mission statements are are always uh, interesting because they're full of platitudes, and most businesses struggle to live by those platitudes. They just uh, write them down on a piece of paper. They might hand them out to employees. Um, My my favorite uh, platitude in in the world of business that I think has some meaning is uh, the motto of the Ritz-Carlton. The motto of the Ritz-Carlton, if you ever go into a Ritz-Carlton, you ask one of the employees uh, what the motto is, they all know it. And the motto is, ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen. It's a very simple statement, right. easy to absorb. And I, in my experience in the Ritz-Carlton, it, it seems to be a somewhat accurate uh, way of describing how the employees see their task in uh, working there. And I think – but most of the time, most businesses struggle to uh, – have the reality of their day-to-day employee conduct fit the mission statement or the uh, motto or whatever is the the thing that comes down from the from the CEO. So let me ask you, in the day-to-day operations of the bank, one, how do you inculcate, teach, explain, inspire your employees with what you've just said? And two, can you give me any evidence that it's more than just window dressing, that, that people take it to heart and that it, that it works? That it works for them, that it works for the bank, that it works for the customers. Uh, that's a great, great uh, comment, a great uh, uh, issue. What I find, many businesses do have um, value statements that contain good things, but also contain a series of bromides and cliches. And the typical bromide and cliches are some kind of form of altruism. <laughs> so, and in a free market. In a capitalist society, businesses really can't afford to be altruistic. <laughs> they will be. They can be. They can have a charitable uh, focus in, in helping their communities get better, but they can't really be altruistic, or they can't stay in business. And what happens is that the employees know that the business doesn't mean it, so they try to figure out what the real culture is. Because people do search for what are the principles by which we're we're operating in in, in this company. Well, they, they look for the reward. What, you know, what gets you ahead? What, what reward? If keeping the 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 principles gets you ahead, they'll keep the principles. If it's just you know cheap talk, they'll do something else. They'll find out what does get you ahead. What, what we have done that I think has worked for us. We have a very clearly defined philosophy. We have a a, a uh, booklet that outlines that philosophy. Every year, uh, I, I make an hour long 
presentation to our employees talking about the BB&T philosophy. It is actually complex and integrated in a certain sense. I mean, if people try to make stuff, you can grasp certain ideas, but when you get in the real world, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a, uh, you know, if I'm in a simple job, it can be con, it can be fairly small. If I'm in a complex job, I got to look at the peripheral integration. So, in a certain sense, uh, you've got to have an integrated philosophy. So, so we, so we present that at both in written form and and in, in a verbal form, looking at some of the nuances and the inter- interconnections among among our value system. And then we have a uh, performance appraisal system that all of our employees get twice a year, and embedded in that performance appraisal system is our 10 core values. And what we have found and what I have found, we never have a performance issue that isn't related to one of our values. <laughs> uh, and now we also look at results. So we don't just look at values because sometimes – you can use that as an excuse not to deal with actual performance, but but everybody twice a year gets feedback about how they're doing in relation to the BB&T value system. Um, and the and the final thing, and I think by far the most important thing, we live our values because they work. One of our core values is justice. Uh, we believe that those that produce the most should receive the most. We're very explicitly clear about that. Did you just say? I'd like you to say that again because I just you know it gives me a it gives me a thrill. Uh, that's not the definition that most people would use for justice. In fact, if you could, could you back up and give us the ten values and and how they're defined? Because if you just said justice, I would have rolled my eyes. But um, that that's uh, I'm, not, I'm not rolling my eyes now. So tell us tell us what they are and and give us a little definition like that. Our our first value is reality, and that means that we believe you ought to start with the facts. What is, is. <laughs> and we use the term wishing something so does not make it so. So we're very much a facts-driven organization, reality-grounded. Our second value is reason. I, I described earlier, we think our capacity to think logically is our means of survival, success, and happiness. What we challenge our employees to do is not have you know high IQs, but have what we call an active mind. And a person with an active mind is committed to learning, and they are particularly effective experiential learners. And they and the reason they can learn more effectively from experience is that they do two very important things. They learn very effectively from their mistakes because they avoid what we call evasion. Evasion occurs when I'm presented with some piece of information that at some level I know needs to be examined, but I refuse to examine it because it threatens something I want to believe about myself or I want to believe about the rest of the world. So I often don't literally don't hear it. And when you evade, you can't learn. And learning from mistakes requires that you admit you made a mistake at a deep level if you're going to change, and so you can't evade. The other aspect of an active mind is is that to recognize that life is a constant education. Uh, we're having an educational experience right now between the two of us. Your questions are educational to me, and hopefully my answers provide some educational experience to you. But I hope it goes beyond that, John, but, uh, to a broader audience. But, yeah, go ahead. At least the two of us. Go ahead. But, but my, my point is that in order to... To, to, to learn from life, you have to stay in focus. You have to express the ultimate aspect uh, of free will, which is the choice to focus your mind or not to be here or not to pay attention. And when people go out of focus, they can't learn. So, so we challenge our employees in the context of, of reason to be have an active mind, to refuse to evade, and to stay in focus and, and to learn learn from life. Our third value is independent thinking, which means thinking for oneself from the facts of reality, uh, being responsible, uh, and in, in, a, in a broad context, we think, well, let me say that a little different. What we think is that independent thinking makes two things both necessary and possible, responsibility and creativity. Uh, it, it, we think the most important meta-psychological decision that anyone can choose to make is to be responsible for themselves. Uh, if you aren't responsible for yourself, you, if you view yourself as a victim, you've given all your power away because you can't, change anybody else you can only change you so you're responsible for you and also all human progress is based on creativity because unless somebody does something better uh there can't be any progress and and, and anything better is going to be different and creativity is only possible to an independent thinker somebody that thinks like the crowd can't be creative can't be innovative can't contribute to human progress that's why entrepreneurs are so important our, our fourth value is productivity, um, and we think, uh, and that we use that in two ways. And uh, we think in a free society and free market, 
profit is a good thing. It's simply the difference between the value of what we create and the cost of creating it. The bigger the difference, the better. <laughs> so we try to run a very profitable company. To be profitable, you have to be very efficient. You have to be very productive. At the individual level, productivity is that gut-level commitment to get the job done. Um, and, and I find the difference between high performers and non-performers is often a, a, a psychological phenomenon. We often find that non-performers are looking for reasons to fail. There's, there's something that's keeping them from being successful. And high performers face the same obstacles, but they have that gut-level commitment to get the job done. Um, our fifth value is honesty. Uh, we think that when you're dishonest, you're disconnected from reality and bad things happen. We don't think that honesty requires that you always be right. You can be honest and be wrong. But what honesty does require is that you say what you mean and you know what you mean. Say what you mean means you don't try to mislead people. We even talk about the issue of the cumulative effect of white lies. <laughs> you can say what you mean. And know what you mean doesn't require that, you're, that you know everything, that you be omniscient, because human beings aren't omniscient. But it does say that you don't claim a level of knowledge that you don't have. And honesty also requires that you keep your agreements. So we're very much an organization. We keep our agreements. We make an agreement, we keep it. Uh, and that's, that we think that's an expression of honesty. Our sixth value is integrity. Uh, we think integrity means acting consistent with one's beliefs. In our business, when you're dealing with money, there are a lot of apparent temptations, right? But we believe that if you develop your principles logically based on the facts, those temptations aren't really temptations. They're just ways to fail. Uh, so, so we always act consistent with our principles. What we think that integrity requires is not sacrifice, but integrity requires a long-term perspective on your life and realizing that some things that might look good in the short term will hurt you in the long term, and you need to run your life with a long-term uh, perspective. Our seventh value is justice. We strongly believe that those that contribute the most ought to receive the most. That's what justice is. Uh, and uh, therefore, we have incentive systems that go all the way down to the teller line. We try to measure performance. And that's a tough process. I'm sure we're wrong sometimes. Uh, but that, the goal is clear. And we're very explicit about that goal. Uh, we think those that contribute the most should, should receive the most. Um, our uh, eighth value is pride. Um, Aristotle said that pride was the greatest of all virtues because to have it, you had to have all the others. You had to be just, have integrity, be a rational, independent thinker. And we think pride serves two very important roles. It's a psychological reminder to do good and a psychological reward for having done good. And we want the kind of organization that everybody associated with BB&T can always be proud of BB&T. And, they can always, and we always want our employees to be able to be proud of themselves. So then that, that requires that you live your values consistently. Um, our ninth value is self-esteem and self-motivation. Um, and, and to some degree, I talked about that earlier in the context that um, we think work is more than work. <laughs> it, 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 or else you're missing a lot of what life is about. You need a sense of purpose through your work, and you recognize that work is a means by which you can earn self-esteem, along with financial rewards. We need, we need the tangible things in life. We don't diminish that in any context. But, it, but it's more than that. <laughs> and, and that. And that we're looking for people that are self-motivated because they realize their work is a lot about who, who they are as a human being at a very deep level. And they have to have passion and energy in their work in that regard. And our final value is teamwork. Uh, we want people that act in their rational self-interest, that have strong personal goals. We want people to think for themselves, that think independently, that don't think like the crowd. But recognize in any kind of organizational context, we're in it together, and that we have to work towards our common goals. And we, we you, know, you use the analogy of the basketball team. The goal is to win the game, right, within, within the context of the rules, which means sometimes I pass when I, I might have more fun shooting because of, the big, because of the, bigger, the, bigger, the bigger goal, which is my goal, my personal goal. And we think teamwork has three dimensions. We think the reason people typically fail a team is they didn't do their own job well, uh, and so we expect you to do your job well. We also ask and, and I guess insist that people root for our, their fellow teammates to be successful. There's an old saying in the South, lie down with dogs, get fleas. <laughs> the, the flip of that's also true. Spend time with great people and get great. We think the most destructive of all human emotions is envy. 
and sometimes we envy our fellow teammates, and uh, and and that, and, and instead of learning from them and getting better, we we try to undermine them, and we try to, you know, I'm not a psychological genius, but we say envy is bad. <laughs> it's bad for you. It, it's a very destructive kind of emotion, and, and we want to drive that out. Root for your fellow teammates to get better, and that will benefit you. You'll learn from them. And, and then the final aspect of, of teamwork is, is I'd call it intellectual. It's understanding how your work affects the rest of the team. And sometimes people don't take responsibility for that. Now, I'll use a simple example. We have a, a branch manager, somebody that runs one of our branches, and She's got to do her job very well, but she also has got to think about how her work impacts the teller line, how it impacts our customer service representatives, and she needs to fill in the expense voucher right so somebody in the accounts payable area doesn't have to correct what she did. Uh, and that's part of being a really good team player for the accomplishment of the end of the team. So, so, so we have that's our integrated value system. It's actually a, I, there's a lot more to say about it, but I also know I talked a long time. Well, but, that's okay. Now, did you read that off a, a sheet, John? No. Okay. I figured you might know it by heart. I do. Uh, I do. <laughs> but here's, here's the. I got a couple questions for you. It's very interesting. But again, I you know most employees. There's sort of two aspects of those principles, values that I find interesting. One is some of them are transparently true, but but hard to implement. So sure. caring about your teammates and having integrity, not lying. All those things are things everyone would agree are good for business and good for productivity. The hard part's getting people to do it. So I, my first part of my question. It's a two-parter. First part is, again, when the rubber meets the road, uh, is that booklet, a one-hour speech, and those two performance evaluations enough? How do you get employees? How do you get that branch manager to really think about that? And does that – one way to do it, obviously, is that performance evaluation twice a year. How can you possibly measure some of those things? I don't mean literally measure because you can't, but I meant implement them in some way. Second question is, profits are good? Justice is those who produce the most get the most. Some employees must roll their eyes and say, gosh, this guy's he's heartless and he's a greedy capitalist. And it, it does so go against the culture of business that's publicly stated. Uh, so I'm curious how you, one, deal with employees who might not find that to be so palatable. And two, do you what kind of process do you use to hire employees who might find all those values uh, good ones? Okay, that's, that's, that's a good, good set of questions. In terms of, let me try to answer the first question. Um, the way we make our value system work, I think, is because we live it. If you think about it, it is an integrated value system, and it does work. It works for individuals. It works for organizations. So I think our employees see managers, not every person by any means. And if you get down to the teller line, that's a harder thing to do because you got more turnover and you got a different you know, level of, of, of time to work often there, but the people that have worked for our organization, people in leadership roles, understand that we take it very seriously because we live it in, in our day-to-day actions. Do we do it perfect? No, but do we do it well? Yes. Uh, in regards to ethical issues, what our employees know, even if you've been a big producer, but if you do something unethical, we will fire you. We will fire you very quickly, unhesitatingly. Sorry, that's it. Why unethical? Do you, besides, this, have, obviously, this, if your hands in the till, uh, this, uh, or you're found uh, rummaging in the uh, safe deposit box area, uh, you'll get fired. But how do you broaden this, that definition? This honestly might be, might be a, a classic kind of case. Uh, uh, somebody that would be would be dishonest would be a, a case of that. We are, are maybe uh, e- even a case might be. Undermining uh, your fellow employees in a way that was, me- you know, measurable and tangible, and you, there, that would be a subjective area sometimes. But if you did something that uh, we were clear, you did for your benefit at the expense of somebody else, uh, that you manipulated the system with, with, and and, and uh, did it in such a means that it it, it hurt the, the the purpose that we all agreed on, we we would we would terminate you. But we would also terminate you for you know, and a lot of organizations find reasons to. You know, people bend the rules. Maybe they, uh, in, in order to get an end result, and the end result works in the short term. We we don't tolerate that. So we're we're very tough on people that violate ethics, and I think the vast majority of our employees know that. Um, in in terms of selection for for those kind of people, we 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 are very explicit. Particularly, we really focus, practically speaking, at the management level. 
uh, about what our values are. We actually can, you can actually, people can beat the test, but you can test for values. <laughs> and we actually have a test in our management, for people going in our management development program, that looks at their core values. We're also very, we use an interview process, and we're very explicit about what our values are, and if these don't, values don't work for you, then you shouldn't come here. <laughs> and and many times, the people that do come here uh, will tell me, and I, I've had this over and over again, well, you know, I had, a, I had a bunch of job offers, I read your values, I met your people, they obviously believe it, that's why I'm here. Uh, and, and so, is that is that process perfect? No, but is it a very good filter? Yes. Yeah. So we do our best at management levels, practically speaking, to hire people that believe that our values work and, and believe it's the right thing to do. Um, in terms of the issue of profit and justice, uh, pro- we, we're very explicit about it, but we do have, this goes back to this bigger picture, longer term kind of perspective. Um, we, we believe in creating win-win relationships, so we don't want to take advantage of our clients. And, and that's, I think, where the issue of profit always comes in. We think part of our mission is to help our clients achieve economic success and financial security. Uh, so we're, you know, fundamental business in relation to our clients is helping our clients achieve economic success and financial security. We expect to make a profit doing that, and we're very explicit about it. But we also expect to earn it. <laughs> we expect to provide them with better quality advice that may, helps them have a better life. And and and, and so uh, we we aren't trying to make a profit by taking advantage of people. We're trying to make a profit by earning uh, a superior reward through superior service. And, and we talk about being being more knowledgeable, about being able to provide them with more quality advice, being more responsive, giving them an answer quicker, being more reliable. You can, and we're, you know, we help people through tough times to the degree that we can. Uh, being more empathetic, which means treating people as, as individuals. So we we try to provide differentiated value-based service and earn a profit doing it. So so the conflict around profit is, hey, I'm making it by taking advantage of other people. That's not how we want to get there. We want to get, we want to make a superior profit, but earn it. And and we're very very explicit about that. We measure client satisfaction, for example, and, and we're the best <laughs> in our market. Our clients are happier than our competitors' clients, and and we think we should charge for that. We're not, you know, we won't say, you know, we're not going to give it away, but we're going to earn it. We're also not going to take it. We're not going to try to figure out how to. We're not we're trying to figure out how to small, outsmart people. And we often pass on things that might be short term profitable. And I, I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, we did not make, we did not get into the negative amortization mortgage business. A negative amortization mortgage is where the interest cost is more than the person pays every month. It sounds good when real estate values are going up real fast, but we've been in the business long enough to know real estate values don't go always go up real fast. So that when people are paying less than the interest on their loan, at, at the end of five years, in most real estate markets, you're going to have a lot of very unhappy people because they're going to owe a lot more on their mortgage than their house is worth, right? That's not a good thing. Uh, that got to be the fad last year and the year before. Huge market in that. We could have made a lot of money doing that. We said, no, nah, we're just not going to do it because it's not good for our clients. Hopefully, we talked some of our clients into getting a fixed rate mortgage, and they're much better <laughs> off today. Some of them just went somewhere else and got that mortgage. They aren't our clients anymore, and they made that choice. But but we don't think profit is earned by doing the wrong stuff. We think profit is earned by doing the right stuff. So those kind of things are connected together. Well, uh, yeah, I agree with you that um, social responsibility of business is to make money. Uh, Milton Friedman's, uh, I think, profoundly deep and usually forgotten principle or, or um, idea. And I, I just want to come back to this uh, cultural issue. I agree with that. I teach my children that. We should probably do a show just on that some time down the road on Econ Talk, just on why profits are good. But our current educational system does not teach our children in general that profits are good. So when people show up at your door, a lot of them must roll their eyes internally. They probably don't want your interviewer to see it when you make that claim because obviously that's just – I mean it's so counter uh, to the current culture business, which I, I have to mention. My, my parents live in Huntsville, Alabama, and there's a billboard uh, near my parents' house from a bank. I, I'm pretty sure it's not BB&T, but I, I can't swear to it. Uh, so, so you'll just have to correct me if I'm wrong. But the billboard says, 
we want to be your friend. And my dad's response to that <laughs> was, you know, I kind of want my banker to take care of my money really right. well and not lose it and give me a, a competitive rate of interest. I don't mind if they smile when they hand over the money or accept it, but uh, – I look to other places for my friends, and I'd like banks to kind of specialize in what they do best. And that's really a you know a simple way of saying what we've been talking about. It's, right. it's a simple way of saying what Milton Friedman had in mind when he says the social responsibility of business is to make profit. He's not saying gouge people and take advantage right. of them, as you point out. He's saying be productive and let people take the the productive gap between what's produced and what the cost is and and enrich people's lives their own and others with with that surplus and but having said all that which I you know again I agree and and feel in the marrow of my bones most people don't feel it in the marrow of their bones and when you say it as a in a job interview or at those evaluations or at your annual speech they must think gosh this guy's a nut do you <laughs> well, deal with does that happen I'm sure there are some people that think that um, I mean, but, you might be a nut anyway. But, right, right. Uh, but um, I think if you say it enough, of course, you got to get some people that haven't been overly polluted by the education. What's interesting, while that's in the culture, uh, interestingly enough, a lot of people come through the education system without even having an opinion on it. If you, if you understand what I'm saying, I'm yeah, saying, that's true. I mean, and, and, and so if you can get people that haven't already formed a hard negative opinion uh, in that regard, a lot of times they're fairly mal- malleable. At the management level, we have a lot of required readings. <laughs> For example, my favorite book uh, is Atlas Shrugged, which is the best defense, I believe, of capitalism ever written. And so that's one of the required readings. Uh, uh, to some degree, over time... It's a fat book, John. Uh, sir? It's a fat book. It's a fat book. Do they it, read it, or do they just carry it around with the, them? The management level people read it. Okay. Because I ask them about it. <laughs> yeah, I bet you do. Uh, and I send it to them personally. Uh, so now we don't require that to go down. You know, you can't couldn't do that for your teller staff. But but it, you're well, you trying. Could, to, but they might not do it. Yeah. You're trying to impact your your leadership in that regard and their beliefs, and and then their beliefs will be expressed in their behavior. I'm sure that some people don't totally agree with Alice Rose, and that's not what this is about. But it is a it is a very powerful presentation of some important ideas, that, and, it, and it will influences, influence somebody's thinking uh, in that regard. So, Now, a lot of people I, – I enjoyed Atlas Shrugged tremendously. The, the problem I have with it is uh, the selfishness issue, and I, when I say the problem I have with it, I, you know, I give a lot to charity. I don't have any problem with enjoying the book. I think that what has limited the, pr- the effectiveness of her principles of capitalism – is a perception that people have that she's about selfishness and she has a book, The Virtues of Selfishness, and that, that it's it's all about me, 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 and what can I, as long as I can get ahead and be happy, nothing else matters. And I don't think that's what you want your employees and your managers to, to learn from that book, correct? Correct, but I don't think that's what the book says. Okay, fair enough. Well, let's, <laughs> yeah. let's move on. I, I, just, yeah. I just want to get that on the table because sure. I, what, it fascinates me that you know there's this famous – uh, I think it's true. It could be apocryphal. There's this famous Reader's Digest poll that asked people what the most influential book in their life was, and the number one book was the Bible, and the number two book was Atlas Shrugged. And I'm thinking, if that's true, why do we live in the world we live in, right? <laughs> she espouses as profoundly as you say – I agree with you – the moral case for capitalism and markets and economic freedom. Why do we have so little of it? Now, Glass could you right. say it's half full – but it's very frustrating to me that so many people love that book and don't vote that way uh, or don't espouse those values to their kids. And I think part of the handicap of her – I think she's a great example of marketing. She packaged that econo- those economic principles in a page turner, uh, which is a great way to get people to read it. But un- to me, unfortunately, she added this component that people either misinterpret or uh, or, or – are not attracted to, which is um, the selfish part of it, and the confusion as we've tried to talk about a little bit today of self-interest and selfishness. So I think that's part of the challenge. Yeah, I, I personally think it's a misinterpretation of, of her, her, her whole, whole theory, but I, I guess that's kind of a subject for another day. Yeah. I, I, let, let me turn. We, we're low on time, and I have a couple things I want to get to. Uh, talk about the banks and well, two, one quick thing. You talked about um, that you 
live by your principles and people are evaluated by them. How is your compensation set? What can you tell me about that publicly that um, that might be of interest to our listeners? It's, it's basically based on the performance of the bank. I have a, the vast majority of my compensation is what's called at risk. Uh, we have uh, goals based on earnings per share growth, return on assets, return on equity. Uh, and my compensation depends on those performance goals. Um, if, if we outperform the goals, I get a, a nice compensation. If we don't, I don't. Uh, the other part of my uh, compensation is in uh, stock ownership in bb and So in theory, um, the better the shareholders do in the long term, the better that I will do. Right. You also get the any any good luck and bad luck, of course, sure. we're down there. And that's one of the challenges of sure. these incentive-based systems is uh, – the role of randomness can be very um, difficult to separate from skill, but obviously that's you know, it's a challenge of any system. Yeah, I mean, the goal is just is there is there a factor of, of misfortune and, and and good fortune? Yes, I will say this over the long term. Uh, yes, luck matters, but I think I, I think it's a, a, a minor factor over the long term. Over the long term, and also in a broader context. In that maybe somebody makes a whole lot more money, but but if they were if they were a very productive person, they might not have been as lucky, but they would have made a good living. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, you, you know there is randomness in life, and there and and there's uh, randomness in Mother Nature. Mother Nature is neither just nor unjust. Mother Nature just is, but I, I think it tends to work out on average for the vast majority of people. Uh, I interrupted you. Talking about how you uh, work with your managers, you, you gave you talked about reading. Do you see yourself as an educator to some extent? Absolutely. As the CEO, I, I, absolutely. I use the term coach, but uh, uh, I think one of the critical roles of CEOs is espousing the philosophy, communicating the philosophy, the value system, educating your employees. Uh, at the senior, what we call our senior leadership level, I send uh, probably. Every other month, I send uh, the senior leadership team books to read. Um, I encourage them to take educational seminars. We operate what we call the BBT University system. <clears throat> our part of our theory, and this goes back to the belief that competitive advantage is in the minds of our employees, because the only natural resource that matters is the human mind. Um, we <clears throat> we invest more in employee education than our competitors do. We spend a lot less on advertising. We took our we still we advertise, but we took a lot of our advertising dollars and invested it in employee education under the theory that the most powerful advertising is word of mouth. If you get really good service from BB and T, we provide you with better quality advice, help you make better decisions uh, in the financial arena, then you're going to be willing to recommend us to your friend. Uh, you know, in the in contrast to that ad, you said what we think we our obligation is to try is to earn the right to be your trusted financial advisor, where you know not your friend. You're referring not, to the yeah, billboard earlier, right? Exactly, where where we provide you better advice, and, and and you'll trust us to do that because we've earned that earned that trust, and then you will recommend us to your friend. To do that, we got to be really good at what we do. <laughs> we we got to be experts. It doesn't yeah. fit on a billboard quite as well. But no, it's, it's a little more yeah. honest, I think. <laughs> it, it, but it works, it, you know. If you get really, if we get do help you make better decisions, you say, well, you know, this guy's really have helped me. It's just like, would you recommend if you go to a doctor and that doctor really does, you know, you, you feel like they're giving you better advice or a better doctor, you wouldn't hesitate to he- recommend them a friend because it's hard to find a good doctor, right? <laughs> yep. Uh, what about uh, eminent domain? I know you've uh, taken a position on that with respect to the bank's actions. Uh, tell tell us about that. Um, well, we were very upset about the recent uh, Supreme Court decision because we thought it really potentially threatened property rights. This over is the, the Kelo decision. Kilo, the Kelo decision. Uh, we thought it really potentially threatened property rights, and property rights are the foundation for economic well-being. You know, there have been a bunch of studies, and interesting rec- recently, that have pretty much demonstrated that um, all these government giveaway programs don't do any good. <laughs> Societies that rise from poverty, what they basically do is change the legal system and improve property rights. The property rights are an essential to economic well-being. Uh, also, we believe the United States is the first country, and maybe the only country ever really founded on a set of basic principles. And the fundamental principle is the concept of individual rights, uh, life, liberty, 
property, the pursuit of happiness. Yeah, I wish Jefferson had put that uh, in that I, in that list. I, it's not quite there, but yeah. it is related to the pursuit of happiness. Hard to pursue happiness without property. Right, right. But 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 that was the context in which the Constitution uh, and the, and the founding fathers developed the principles of the United States. So. So we felt like the Kelo decision was a, a fundamental threat to property rights, um, and, and that that is a threat to our long-term economic well-being. We also know that you know, if, if the government can take your property and basically give it to somebody else, and I know they're supposed to justly re- uh, compensate you, but that's always an interesting year. If you're not willing to sell, where's this just compensation, right? Uh, you know, if they can take the food off your table in a certain sense, what what rights do you ultimately have? We're, we're a big uh, real estate lender. We do lots of residential development, lots of construction lending. What's interesting is 99% of commercial real estate development, residential development, takes place without eminent domain. So so why why is this even necessary, right? <laughs> uh, and I mean, my own observation is the vast majority of projects where eminent domain is used often have with them some kind of government subsidy. And one of the interesting questions is, why do you need a project uh, if it's, it's got to have eminent domain, it's got to have a government subsidy? Uh, uh, and the answer typically is it's, it's not economically viable and shouldn't be done in the first place. And for our listeners who don't know, eminent domain is the idea where the government comes in, takes your property against your will, right. and compensates you uh, for the value of that in theory. But as, as you point out, that compensation – in some dimension, is often uh, uh, not accurate because you could have sold it. There, there's some strategic issues. I want to we'll skip over those, but the the basic point here we're talking about is the government seizing of property and uh, and paying people for it. Well, here, here's an example. When we took that position, I got a zillion letters. You but took there, which position? A, a position against uh, the eminent domain uh, of taking property from one individual and giving it to another. They came out against that, but you, and how did that? But, I want to hear about the reaction, but how did how did you did you do anything at the bank level besides voice your disagreement with the policy? We wouldn't. We what we our policy was that we would not finance projects where eminent domain was used for that purpose to take property from one private individual and giving it to another. So you, we so you you we gave up make your, you gave up your short term profitability there in what you thought was a longer term perspective. Absolutely. Okay. So go ahead. So what kind of reaction did you get? Well, it's very interesting. But we did it as a matter of principle, given our philosophy and and as a communication to our own client base and our employees. I didn't expect much reaction. We actually got unbelievable reaction. We had thousands of people that wrote us, sent us emails, called, and thousands of people that moved their checking accounts to bb and What was interesting to me is how many cases, even before Kilo, uh, eminent main had been abused. I got unbelievable letters that almost made you want to cry. Sure. I got a letter from a lady that, that had owned a farm in her family for 150 years. And the, and the local mayor and the city council wanted to build a municipal golf course. Now, that's a real essential thing, right? Oh, they, yeah. they already had 10 golf courses in the county, but he wanted another golf course. So he used eminent domain to take this lady's farm to build a municipal golf course. And, and, and the stories went on and on. And then the just compensation thing was very interesting. I got a number of stories where eminent domain was used, and people, it was clear that that the court system was basically because you remember a lot in a lot of states judges are just elected uh, they're they're politicians who are lawyers right <laughs> and 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 it people is a that, popular background for politicians yeah, yeah that, that's the, 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 a judge is a is a politician I mean in most states he gets elected and he's a lawyer that that's the combination when you, when you think about judges and anyway in a lot of states in, in a, lot, a number of cases people weren't so much against the eminent domain but they were against the price they were being paid and it was clear. The, the the justice system was working with the local governments because they're all often connected together to bring down the prices, basically so they made the project economic feasible, buying the stuff the property for less than it probably was worth, mm-hmm. and, and and so the, you had abuses. We say why is that even a public issue? And they had abuses where um, the people were being under underpaid. It was it's, was, now, did did you implement that decision about eminent domain after the Kilo case or before? After, because it drew your attention. Pretty yeah, I mean, it just really and it it pretty much potentially opened up the floodgate. Although a lot of states are now reacting, and probably the abuse of eminent domain that may have been slowed at the state level, but it certainly opened the potential for tremendous abuse. 
you know, we have an earlier podcast. Uh, I'll alert our listeners. You can go to our homepage at econtalk.org. Uh, Clint Bolick, uh talking about this issue in, in a little more detail. But it's, it's a very important issue. The general issue of property rights is very important. Well, I know we're almost out of ta- time. I know you have to run. Just a final question. Uh, you were, I think, an undergrad at the University of North Carolina, as I was, correct? Yes, I was. And I, as I, I was as well. So you're well educated, but but, but well, I, there's a puzzle here. I think you got your MBA at Duke, according I, to your bio. So I did. What went wrong there? <laughs> I get that a lot. You're a rational person. You know, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I have good friends at Duke, and, and Mike Munger, who's a frequent guest here, is uh, uh, chair of political science at Duke. It's a fine institution, but um, I just had to give you a little needle there, John. I'm sorry. I happen to think they're both great schools. How's that? Yeah, it's a very, very politic answer, but it may <laughs> violate your uh, your value of integrity and honesty. White lies can be very dangerous. Um, I actually believe they're both great schools. <laughs> uh, it's possible. I guess it's possible. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed listening to this today. It's a slightly different uh, podcast, uh, yes. and it could be a a. Uh, uh, a model down the road. If you've enjoyed this uh, out there, please send me an email and let me know what you think of this. Uh, we don't we don't spend a lot of time here on business strategy. We've gotten into a lot of other issues, but if you enjoyed it, uh, I'd like to hear from you. Uh, my guest today has been John Allison, Chairman and CEO of BB and T. John, thanks for joining us at Econ Talk. Yes, sir. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>